Good morning, Daryl. Good morning, good morning. Well, it's nine o'clock Central Daylight Time, and that means it's time for another Bible study, and um, we're going to cut it a little bit short. Nita and I are in Hot Springs this weekend, came down to celebrate a 16th birthday of uh, some friends of ours, Merlin Tagosi and, and uh, Wayne and their son, Seth. And while down here, I had a chance to visit with Mark Goad, and uh, he has invited us to come by his church this morning after we finish this Bible study and allow me some time to offer some information regarding the ministry in the Philippines. So uh, we'll cut short about the, about 9.55 this morning and uh, so we can get have time to get to, to Mark's church. It's about a 15-minute drive from from the hotel we're staying in. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get started with our, our study. We're still in Romans 10. We'll finish that uh, this morning and get into Romans 11. And with that, I trust you've all prepared your hearts for the study of God's word. And we will open with a brief word of prayer and then get started with our studies. Father, again, thank you for the day and for our lives. You've given us life. May we always remember that that's a grace provision. Uh, you're the one that gives us a life, and we would choose, I pray all of us would choose to uh, take this life you've given us and live it in such a way that you are glorified. And the only way we can do that is as we yield to God, the Holy Spirit, Spirit who lives inside of us, and as we take in the Word of God and allow the Word of God to change our thinking so that we can begin to think as Christ would think, and with those thoughts, do as Christ would do, and say as Christ would say, for your honor and glory. Teach us this morning, in Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, so let me uh, close my participants block up here, and uh, oh, I didn't want to do that. We'll do that. There we go. And we'll get started with Romans 10. We're actually in Romans, uh, uh, verse 18 of Romans 10. We finished with verse 17. Uh, it's been two weeks, two or three weeks now since we've uh, studied in Romans. So I want to read uh, as a time of review, uh, Romans 10, 11 to 17, and then we will pick up with uh, Romans 18 at that point. So here we go, Romans 10 verses 11 to 17. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Him, of course, being Jesus Christ. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, Paul writes, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And so with that, uh, we'll move into verse 18. Where Paul writes, let me, there we go, okay. Verse 18, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, Paul makes a very personal statement here when he says, but I say, perhaps this is an objection he had 
even given to the Lord. The objection is that Israel never heard these things. How would they have had the opportunity to hear and believe the message? So what does Paul do? Paul quotes from Psalm 19, where David writes in verses 1 to 4 of verse 19, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the works of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun. Now this relates back to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. This natural revelation demonstrates the existence and power of God. It is a perfect revelation that can lead any man to seeking more revelation regarding God. The more they will be provided is the gospel. I've got something here. Admit, okay, I've I um I failed to un unclick the admittance to the to the room for our study, so I will probably be have to pause once in a while uh, when someone uh, wants to get in a little bit later. So uh, bear with me. Okay, so this natural revelation demonstrates the extent the existence and power of God. It is a perfect revelation that can lead any man to seeking more revelation regarding God. The more that will be provided is the gospel. This revelation cannot lead to salvation, nor to a personal... How far are they willing to go? Well, they're, as you point out, they're willing to ignore acts of war. I mean, when, when our own intelligence community tells us that they're hacking into the Trump campaign to help, uh, to help Kamala Harris, win the election, when, somebody... when they engage in an act of war of trying to assassinate uh, President Trump, and perhaps most importantly, when they engage in the act of war of firing through through its Houthi-controlled... Somebody's, somebody's iPad decided to, to share information with us, and so uh, bear with me. I needed to go back here and do some do some muting of things. Sorry for the for the interruption. Uh, that's one of the things about when people join. If not, if they're not aware that their microphone is on, uh, it will it will interfere with what's going on. But anyway, we can get through that too. Let's uh, move on. The revelation, the revelation that they see, they see the skies, they see all the awesome stuff in the world, the nature that what's going on. This revelation, however, that's revealing God and the hand of God in all of this, this revelation cannot lead to salvation nor to a personal relationship, but it can lead man to a longing that comes from an unmet need to know the one who has created him and created all that surround him. At this point, man is at God consciousness, we would call it. That consciousness of God demands a volitional decision. You're conscious that there is a creator. Question, do I seek God? my creator, or do I digress to creation itself? Uh, how many people? How many? I've lived in Hawaii, I've lived in Colorado and North Dakota and all around across the country and other worlds, and there are so many people that get involved in creation. And Friday comes, they get in their camper, and away they go to the weekend, and that's that's how they worship. Well, that's getting involved in the creation but is it really the worship of the creator do i seek the one who made the tree 
or do I worship the tree? Nature shows us that we can depend upon nature and depend upon God who created nature. We can trust the cycles of nature, the sun rising every day, the course of the stars. So what conclusion can we draw? We can trust God with the very details of our life and our eternal life. So Paul tells us that light has been given even in nature, and yet this is not all. God has given more and more light. God gave more and more light to Israel. More prophets, more written word, more prophecies fulfilled. Yet, the increase in light did not automatically result in an increase in faith. There's a principle here. Belief can reject bright light. As well, unbelief can reject bright light as well as dim light. In Israel's history, it seems that as more light was given, rejection of that light increased. Unbelief increased even to the point that when the Messiah did come, they rejected him. So, Paul now in verses 19 to 20 shows how God is trying to draw Israel to faith. Now remember, we're looking at these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And it's a, it's a parent parenthesis, we've, we've called it that, Paul's teaching from Romans 1 through 8. And if, you would, if we would just jump ahead to 12, jumping over 9, 10, and 11, the last verse in verse 8 is a perfect, perfect application in the first verse of chapter 12. But in wow. these three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, Paul is addressing the church in Rome, which had both Jew and Gentile in that church. And so he was addressing issues to both Jew and Gentile. In verse 9, uh, he talked much, much about Israel's past. In verse 10, we're looking at Israel at that moment. When, I don't think we're muted. When he was, let me see here. Somebody's got a microphone on again. Anyway, I'm not going to let it bother me. So anyway, so now in 10, he's talking about to both the Jews as of today, as, as at that time, all right, the real time when Paul was, was speaking and writing these things to them. And then in, in chapter 11, we'll get to later today, that talks about Israel's future. So Paul shows now in verses 19 and 20, how God is trying to draw Israel to faith. So let's look at these two verses, Romans 10, 19 and 20. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? At the first, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who sought me, not I became manifest to those who did not ask me. God sent the prophets. God revealed the word. God worked mightily in the nation of Israel, yet they rejected over and over again. So much light, so much rejection. Did they come to take it for granted that they were a nation established by God? That they were God's people? That to them were given covenants and promises? That the Son of God himself was promised to be their king? More light, greater unbelief. So God approached them a different way. Have you ever watched a child, a young child, and I've talked about this before, a young child playing with a toy, and watch them, as you watch them, they grew tired playing with it. So what does the first child do? Now we got two children and watch when they were, they were playing with the toy. The first child, that's mine, give it back. You can't play with it. He had no interest in it until some other child wanted to play with it. That is the approach God used with Israel. God understands this principle in fallen human nature, and he uses it for his glory. We look 
He used it even today to make people, to make Christians wake up. We see revival in many parts of the world, but not here. We see churches that offer nothing, growing, but not churches where sound doctrine is taught. God will use this aspect of human nature, our envy, our possessiveness, our jealousy to get us to realize what we have and what he has given. God in his desire to save many and to bring many of his children to maximum glory will at some times pour blessings out on others to motivate us, motivate us to faith dependence upon him. So Paul gives four illustrations of this, first with Moses, then with Israel. Verse 64. Here, next, next screen, 65. First, God told Moses that he would use a people who lacked organization. When he says, I will make you envious by means of those who are not a nation. Israel was, of course, very proud of, it, of its national status, its government, courts, and laws. But God would use those who lacked all these finer points of civilization, of government, even the finer points of justice and law. He saves them and blesses them because they put their faith in him. With Moses, Paul points out God would use a people who were far less intelligent than the Jew to arouse the Jews to envy. When he says, I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. Now we know the Jews are an intelligent people. Of organizations awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, 22% were founded or co-founded principally by Jews or by people of half-Jewish descent. Since the turn of the century, such as from the year 2000 onward, Jews have been awarded 24% of all Nobel Prizes and 26% of those in the scientific research fields. They dominate the fields of science, literature, the arts, music, philosophy, and economics. Yet this brilliant people with tremendous minds are often confronted by the ignorant savage who is untaught, unlearned in understanding, who has believed in the Messiah the Jews rejected. God's gracious salvation should arouse and awaken his people, but it so often does not. Then Paul jumps ahead to the time of Isaiah and tells them that God will save and bless those who are less motivated than the Jews. When he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. One of the characteristics of the Jews had been their zeal to know God. As Paul writes back in Romans 10 verse 2 in the last chapter, or this verse 2 of this chapter, I should say, when he writes, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. He's speaking about Israel. However, their zeal was misdirected, and they sought God's righteousness by human effort, by works. So God ends up saving and blessing a people who were not even thinking about God that often. The Romans, the Greeks. This is to arouse to envy, to make jealousy, jealous, so that to those to whom much was revealed would seek the God of grace and love by faith. God will even go to those who are not asking for him in any consistent manner. When he says, I revealed myself to those who did not seek me. Well, I've got another one that wants to get in. Here we go. All right. Uh, let me change this down here again. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, folks. So here we go. God will even go to those who are not asking for him in any consistent manner. The Jews were people of prayer. Many prayers, some offered every day and every night. They had books full of prayers. They were asking for God, but so often asking based upon merit in themselves. Gentiles, well, they do not do much praying and they did not do much asking, but God revealed himself to them. God did this and told Israel he would do this to wake them up, 
to what they had. Even as Paul writes this, he is telling the Jews to look at the Gentiles, the ones the Jews always considered so inferior, so lacking organization, understanding, motivation, and prayers. Look at them, he said. They have that which you rejected. So now Paul sets up the next chapter with the next verse from Isaiah 65. Romans 10, 21. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. What a beautiful picture of God, of his patience towards his people. 4,000 years ago, Abraham trusted God by faith. And now, 4,000 years later, God is still stretching out his hand to unbelieving Israel. And in doing so, he demonstrates that he has not finished with his Old Testament people. Not only today, in this present age, can any Jew put faith in Christ and be saved, but in the tribulation period, God will again deal directly with the Jews and many will be saved. I think one of the most amazing things about this passage is to realize that in order to perish, in order to go to hell, in order to remain in unbelief, you have to resist the pleas of God who is stretching out his hand, beckoning you to salvation, beckoning you to eternal life by faith in his son. Consider this. If God so earnestly beckons those who are unbelievers, do you not also think that he earnestly beckons you, his child, to greater faith and trust in all he has for you? his very highest, and his best. Our response should be my utmost for his highest. And that brings us to the end of chapter 10. So let me uh, open up chapter 11 with a new share. And here we go. Chapter 11. And let me get it over here in my other computer. Okay, so here's the third of this, of these three chapters we call a, a pair of parentheses. And I said, as we've said before, chapter 9 was Israel's past. Uh, chapter 10, which we just finished, was Israel's present at that time, as Paul was addressing the church in Rome at that time. And now we look into Israel's future. So in chapter 9, Paul focused on Israel's past. In chapter 10, Paul has established the way of faith that is extended even to Israel in the time of the age of grace. Having rejected their king and his kingdom, some may think that God is finished with Israel, as multitudes do. That's a reality. But that is not the case. God is not finished with Israel. Romans 10 describes God's desire for Jews and Gentiles to be saved. Now here in Romans chapter 11, we're dealing with future Israel. And we study this chapter, as we study this chapter, you will see that this chapter flies in the face of what I guess 90% of Christendom stands on. And that premise is that God is all through with the Jew. That when Israel supposedly cried for the crucifixion of Christ, that God just turned them out, turned his back on them, and is through with the Jews. And basically, folks, that's, that's covenant theology. It started out as replacement theology, and from replacement theology came covenant theology. And basically, there's only two systems of interpreting scripture today. And that is covenant theology with this idea of God is through with Israel. So everything in the Bible from cover to cover belongs to Christianity or dispensational theology. That God has, has set plans for certain people at certain times throughout all of human history. And that's, of course, what, what we have, have been studying as from a dispensational perspective but i would say that probably if you look at the at the um 
uh, what the different, what the churches, the denominational churches and the groups that gather. If you're, if you're finding, looking at, hear about a new uh, organization or a new Christian group or whatever, look at what they believe. Look at their, their belief system as they list them. And you'll, you'll discover that most of them are covenant theologians. They, they think that God is totally finished with the Jew. So consequently, with that in mind, all the Old Testament prophecies and promises fell through the cracks because God is no longer dealing with them. Well, if Christendom is going to take that approach, then they have to take at least Romans chapter 11, besides lots of other verses, and tear them out of their Bibles and throw them away. Because here in this chapter, Paul makes it clear that God is not through with his covenant people, Israel. And we have a principle we'll begin with. God's promise to his chosen nation, Israel, has not changed. God is immutable. That means he's not subject to change. And his promise is sure and absolute. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So we begin in verse 1 of chapter 11. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul uses three arguments to show that God is faithful even to unfaithful Israel. One, first argument, himself as a Jew who has believed in Christ. That's from part B of verse one. Second, an historical illustration during the time of Elijah, a time of great apostasy in Israel. And third, a present illustration that looks to God preserving a remnant in every generation. So the question is asked and answered. God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. An absolute rejection of the very thought that God could change his mind. So speaking of changing of minds, why do we change our minds? Well, one, we change our minds because things happen that are out of our control. Two, because circumstances change and we are not prepared for the change, or three, because we are surprised by the decisions and actions of others. But God is not subject to change because God is not subject to surprise. In his omniscience, he knows all that is knowable, and he knows all the alternatives, and his plan is greater than any circumstance. It's not a surprise to God that Israel rejected her king and his kingdom. So his first, Paul's first illustration is personal. Paul was an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a descendant of Abraham, and he was saved. Paul was an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. Now Paul goes back to the time of Elijah, the northern kingdom, in verses 2 to 4. Preserving a remnant in every generation, we'll find those that in verses 5 through 10. So we pick up with verse 2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now this is taken from 1 Kings chapter 19, when Elijah the prophet is fleeing for his life from Jezebel, the evil Gentile heathen queen of the northern kingdom. Elijah had just defeated all the prophets of Baal, but now fears one woman. He ran all the way to Mount Sinai. In his depression, he complains to God, as we read here in 1 Kings 19.10. And he, Elijah, said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my face and take it to take it away, seek my life to take it away. In response, 
to this first complaint, God tells Elijah to stand on the mountain and allows him to see the power of nature, a wind so strong it tore the rocks apart, an earthquake and fire. But God was not in these. Then the prophet heard a gentle blowing. This gentle breeze was the Holy Spirit. And this showed Elijah that he must depend upon the Holy Spirit as his source of hope and protection. Chapter 11, verse 3. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And alone I am left. And they are seeking my life. Here, the prophet repeats his complaint as recorded in 1 Kings 19, 14. Then he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So the Lord promised in 1 Kings 19, 15 to 17, that he would deal with those who desired to kill his prophets. And the Lord also has Elijah anoint Elisha as the next prophet. That's recorded in verses 15 to 17 of, of 1 Kings 19. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Then the Lord tells this frightened prophet in verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Verse 3, taken from 1 Kings 19. Then we come to verse 4. But what is the divine response to him? And that's what we read in 18. I have kept for my seven thousand for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Three things we see from the illustration of Elijah. We too often forget that human knowledge is limited. We do not see clearly, and we don't understand all the issues. Elijah thought he understood it all, but he did not. When God is in control, which he is always in control, things are never as bad as they seem. Our knowledge does not encompass the knowledge of God. We too often forget about God's unlimited power. Elijah forgot how powerful God was, that God was more powerful than the circumstances. We may see what is going on in the world, and we may think that God has lost the battle, but he never does. God cannot lose because he uses the opposition against him to win. Elijah had no reason to despair, nor do we. We too often forget about life's unmixable principles. If salvation is by grace, then it can't be by works. Principle number one. If salvation is by works, then it cannot be by grace. Principle number two. If salvation is by grace, then we are not kept secure by works. Principle number three. Elijah came to a point where he thought he deserved something better, perhaps because he was so brave in the face of the prophets of Baal. However, <clears throat> Whenever man begins to think he deserves better, he is trying to put God into his debt. And you cannot mix works and grace. The only thing we have that will allow us to meet grace is faith. Paul brings this historical illustration to a current application, verse 5. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. In this same way, 
indicates that God is not working in different ways at different times. We may have dispensational differences, but the faithfulness of God is eternal. God's gracious choice, his gracious election. Remember that election comes out of God's foreknowledge and gives the believing sinner a way into the family of God. This is grace. It is not a sovereign choice of God, nor is it a method of works by man. It is God providing a place in his family for the one he knew beforehand would believe in his son for salvation. Let's give me a, let's look at an illustration. When you send out an invitation to a dinner party with an RSVP, you wait for the response. When you receive a response that someone is accepting, what do you do? You set a place at the table for them. God has set a place at the table for us. And that place was set from eternity past because God in his foreknowledge knew that you would accept his RSVP. So Paul says there were thousands in Elijah's day and there are thousands perhaps in the city of Rome alone who are saved by faith and live by faith, not bowing the knee to Caesar. Verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Well, let's consider some systems of works that human beings have come up with, with this idea that somehow we got to work. First, we have legalism. Instead of being holy, as God is holy and living by faith, we live by petty rules and regulations. When we achieve a measure of success in these, we pat ourselves on the back and convince ourselves that we have met the demands of righteousness. Regulations, what are they? Uh, don't smoke, don't drink alcohol, don't go to discos. Don't allow the boys to swim with the girls. Read your Bible every day. Attend church every Sunday. Teach Sunday school. Attend prayer meeting. Tithe. Say five nice things to someone before you leave church. Serve as a missionary. Give to the poor. Send money for a starving child in South Africa. Visit your mother's grave at least three times a year. Respect your father no matter what. Volunteer to help at vacation Bible school. Be active in the WMU. Serve as a deacon in your church. Repair the leaky roof of the church. Visit the sick. I didn't number them all, but just like, you know, a nice long list of things, and we'll just check them off. I don't smoke, I don't drink, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and compare what we have. Well, if I can mark off 70% of these, I'm good. No, that's legalism. By a rigid system of law is another way. That's a second system of works, a rigid system of law. Many believers today who would deny any association with legalism, that list of things we just looked at, live by the law of, a, of the Bible. For example, it says in the Bible, Malachi, you got to tithe. Or it says in, in the New Testament, Paul says we got to be water baptized, water baptism, or dedication. A lot of people think, well, water baptism isn't necessary, but let's go dedicate. I have a new business, so let's have a priest come over and dedicate my new business for the Lord. I got a new car, so I put a sign on the front, God's gift to me, I've dedicated it to God. Some system of law as a means through obedience of arriving at God's righteousness. They're constantly wanting to go back to some law system, the Old Testament law, the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospels, verses extracted from the content of the epistles as their rules for life and godliness. This places a heavy emphasis on obedience. However, it is not an obedience that comes from faith. Third, we have emotions. Emotions are used to fool oneself into thinking that because you feel good, because you feel close to God, you are. Emotions are wonderful if they are responding to your knowledge of God and if your emotional expression is pure and not self-centered. 
closely associated with emotionalism is number four, ritual. The adherence to a rigid ritualistic system whereby the believer performs certain functions, stand up, sit down, sing this, say that, whatever, and in so doing, feels spiritually satisfied, thinking that he or she has impressed God. Another one, benevolence. Benevolence can become a human system of righteousness in which the Christian thinks that by doing good for others and helping others, he or she is serving God. Benevolence in helping others is much needed, and it is a vital function of the local church. But this function follows faith. It's a, it's a result of faith. It's an outworking of faith. It does not replace faith. And then we have Christian activism. Many believers today think they have the righteousness of God when they go out and fight for a cause that they, are, they have assumed is God's cause. The more they march, the more they picket, the more they are arrested, the more righteous they assume they are. Realize there were social ills and social causes the believers of the first century could have gotten involved in, yet there is no record that they did. When we have the right and freedom to vote, to help in the process, we should, but not as a means of attaining righteousness. Then we have psychology. This is one of the big ones among evangelicals today. They reinterpret God's righteousness in terms of psychology. The fascination many believers have with psychology comes about because psychology does do a good job of analyzing problems that people carry with them in life. As Christians, we have too often failed to be sensitive to the emotional healing some people have. The problem of psychology enters in when you go beyond his needs, needed sensitivity to using psychology instead of the word of God and the word of God's grace to solve the problems. If they're meeting the demands of psychology, which often make good human sense, they assume they have the righteousness of God. Let me give you an example. They often end up veering away from the word, especially when it comes to grace and getting involved with psychological interpretation. Grace cannot be mixed with works. Paul has made it clear that God is not rejecting his people. Yet in verses 7 to 10, we see the majority are turning away. Romans eleven seven. 7. What then, he says, what Israel is seeking, is it not, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. This is really a horrible statement. For it shows what happens to man, even one to whom so much has been revealed, when they reject the truth. Israel sought for righteousness, as we read back in Romans 9, 31 and 32. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. The quest was right. That mean, the means were wrong. The quest was right, but the means were wrong. Who ended up obtaining righteousness? Those who were chosen, elected by God. Who in his foreknowledge knew they would believe in his son? Those who were chosen is one word in the Greek New Testament and is the word eglogi. So it should be translated those who were the chosen. The impetus for one to become one of the chosen or one of the elect was their faith. The word obtained is the word epiducano. And it's a verb in the active voice because it is the faith of a man or a woman or child that results 
in salvation. So our principle, in any dispensation, God has provided an election to salvation to those who believe in Christ. So the first part of this verse declares what happens to a person, Jew or Gentile, who believes in Christ. The second half of this verse, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Through verse 10, describes what happens when a person, Jew or Gentile, rejects salvation. However, since Paul is addressing the Jews, the interpretation is to them, while the application is to the entire human race. The contrast here is obtained versus hardened. And the rest were hardened, it says. Pu'uru is the word. And it means to petrify, to harden. As an aorist passive indicative, it means they received this hardening at a specific point in time. And so we have several principles we can draw from this. Election to privilege is a grace provision of God. Verse 6. It is by grace. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Israel did not obtain it because they sought righteousness by works. We obtained it because we did the only thing man can do without merit, and that is to place faith in Christ. Righteousness was obtained because we were elected. We were elected because we had faith in Christ. Apart from faith, when doctrine, co where, when doctrine comes and is rejected, the test is failed and hardening results. God is actively involved in our obtaining, but not actively involved in the hardening. The hardening of the heart comes because that which is true is rejected. And every time it is rejected, the capacity to recognize the truth diminishes. When the Lord began teaching in parables, it was because he did not want to give the people who were rejecting truth any more truth to reject. As he spoke in Matthew 13, 13 to 16, he says, therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they, are, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. And verse 8, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. Then we move on. Here, Paul then quotes Isaiah 29, 10. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep, he has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads, the seers. And then in Deuteronomy 29, 4, yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Those two passages were quoted in Romans eleven eight. This spiritual dry rot sees in as much, it sees in as more and more truth is rejected. They come to a point where in grace, God blinds the ones who reject to even seeing more truth because they will reject it as well. Verse nine, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a redistribution, a retribution to them. Their table here is an idiom for the Old Testament law. 
that which was to point to the need for a savior became a snare, a trap, a stumbling block to them. Now, even today, the Jews study the law, yet they do not know the Old Testament. Their time is spent developing details that lead not to entitlement, but to legalistic slavery. They reason, they debate, they argue, they become more and more distracted. A rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, once wrote this. He said, quote, Paul claimed that obedience to the Torah could not guarantee salvation. Rather, salvation was obtained only through acceptance of and faith in the prophet Jesus Christ. To believe that a person could atone for his own sinful condition, though any effort on through any effort on his part, as for example, by observing the laws of the Torah, was to Paul a delusion. The rabbi goes on. Paul eagerly announced, announced that what man could not accomplish for himself, namely salvation, could not be, in, be accomplished for him. Only God, however, was powerful enough to atone for man's sinfulness. And Paul held that the death of Christ Jesus was the act of divine atonement. We Jews have rejected this Gentile Christian view. Judaism, as shaped by our rabbis in Palestine, conceived of the body as a gift, and to this day regard the body as holy and wholesome. This rabbi goes on. Any inclination by man to commit a wrongdoing, we hold, resides not in the body, but in the heart, of my, heart or mind. Thus, man by himself does indeed possess the power to atone for his own misdeed, and we Jews have in our Torah the guidance directing our hearts and minds to righteous living. Now, that was a rabbi wrote these things regarding Paul's teaching. It is this type of thinking that so accurately understands the issue and yet rejects it that Paul is referring to here in these verses. Their law becomes a stumbling block and the source of of retribution. The results come from Psalm 69, 23. May their eyes grow dim so that they cannot see and make their loins shake continually. Verse 10. There it is. Verse 10 is Psalm 69, 23. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. Their eyes are darkened and the Old Testament law becomes a burden that bends their backs under its heavy load, yet they will not by faith believe in Christ. Romans eleven eleven. I say then they did not stumble so as to fail as to fall, did they? May it never be. But their trans but their transgression by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, the Jews, jealous. In Romans 11, verses 11 to 24, Paul raises another question. What about the national promise to Israel? While in any age, individual Jews can come to Christ for salvation. Does this mean that God has withdrawn the promises he made to his Old Testament people? They did stumble, but it was not a once and for all irrevocable fall. May it never be. But by their rejection, salvation comes in full force to the Gentiles in this new age. So through to verse 24, Paul gives five arguments to prove that, that God will deal with Israel again. And in the future, they will again become a godly nation. The first argument is found at the end of verse 11. The salvation of the Gentiles was designed to reach Israel. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them, Israel, jealous, is what he wrote in verse 11. This should, as we saw at the end of chapter 10, arouse to envy those to whom so much has been revealed. In the book of Acts, we find that Everywhere Paul went, he first tried to reach the Jews, and it was only when they rejected Christ did he return to 
the Gentiles. Okay. The second argument is presented in Romans 11, 12 to 15. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to, of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might prove, move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Paul states that Israel must once again be a godly nation because only then will worldwide blessing come upon the earth. Paul's argument is this. If the riches of God's grace has come to the Gentiles through the failure of faith on the part of Israel, how much greater will the riches of grace be when in a future time, Israel turns to God in faith? Paul looks ahead to the messianic reign of Christ when perfect Good environment morning. will be... Come on in. Good. When, as we read in Isaiah, Isaiah 11, verse 9, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And Isaiah 65, 25, the, the, uh, here. the wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says cool. the Lord. Well, that's exactly where they should be. I know. Somebody, keep your microphone, that. please. Well, there's plenty of that stuff here. The microphone is turned on, on, please. Plenty of paper. These prophecies look ahead to the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And we'll we'll stop with this. We've got about a minute. I need to shut down and pack up and get down to, to Mark's church. So let's just read this. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And I will make you a great nation, the promises he made to Abraham. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we're gonna we're gonna pause here. We'll pick up here, back here, and uh, verses uh, eleven through twenty-four. We've just made it, made it through eleven and twelve, but we'll pick up with these verses uh, next Sunday and um, continue on in our study of Romans chapter 11. And so with that, uh, let me close with a word of prayer and we'll get packed up and go see Mark and his church. Thank you, Father, for another time in your word. I just so appreciate the opportunity that we have uh, using the modern technology to gather around the table of your word, even though we're not all under one roof, we're all here to, to spend time with you in your word so that we can grow. We are, please, may we make the choice to yield to God the Holy Spirit. Growth cannot happen unless we choose to yield to the Spirit instead of to our sin nature. Romans 6, 13, yielding to the, to the Spirit. And when that happens, and we add to that your word, spiritual growth will come about. Our lives will change. And we will become more and more like Christ, which is your desire for each and every one of us. Thanks again, Father, for this day. Glorify yourself in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we'll be, we'll be with you Wednesday as scheduled. We've got a couple of minutes. I just drank my wheatgrass. Oh, good. <laughs>